Now we have a fantastic lineup of people this evening who will share their experiences of education and life under COVID and will also share their thoughts on what we can learn from it and what schools and teachers might learn from the COVID experience. We have Barbara Sandland, Sarah King, Sharon Smith and Shardia Palmer who are all PhD students and many of them employees and parents and 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 I suspect much of that juggling will feature in their fabulous accounts this evening. We also have Simon Wallace and Clara Jorgensen, who used to be PhD students, but are now researchers, and they will share some work that they've been doing, some research which has looked at the COVID experience. Please keep the questions flowing through this question uh, through the question and answer um, box and chat for, um, box facility and without further ado I'm going to introduce the first speaker and that's Barbara Sandland and to invite Barbara to speak to us. Barbara. Good evening all. Now Typically, I've got a feeling my internet's rather unstable at the moment, so I'm hoping you're all going to be able to hear me all right. Um, so just to give you some context about myself, um, I'm Barbara. Um, I'm a PhD student at the University of Birmingham. Um, I'm married with three kids. And um, as you can say, I'm autistic. My husband's autistic. My daughter's autistic. My son's autistic. And my third son probably is, but we haven't got that diagnosis just yet. Um, so my daughter's now 18, uh, she turned 18 in October this year, so she was year one of our levels during lockdown. My son's 15, he was year 10, and my youngest son is eight. Um, my husband had to work from home, hence um, the shed, that's where he works, where I kick him out to every day. Um, and somewhere in all of that I was doing my PhD, so um, Covid lockdown for us was quite a busy time. Want to move that on, Julie? Yeah. <laughs> um, so we were asked to reflect a little bit on um, what it was like for our kids during COVID. So I've split it between my daughter and my son. That's not pictures of them. I wouldn't be that cruel to them, but it's a pretty good representation of what they look like most of the day. Um, so for my daughter, um, College wasn't going well anyway, I'll be honest. Um, but she found the lack of routine, the lack of having to go out the house, the lack of not being busy, really challenging. And that was the biggest impact for COVID for her. Um, so she went from really not liking college to really hating college um, and ended up dropping out. Um, and largely because no support was offered for her at all. We'd been waiting 12 months for an EHCP plan um, that we, we eventually had an EP assessment for, but nothing had come from it. So college weren't supporting and basically we were just sort of left trying to pick up the pieces. Um, she was referred for mental health support in June and we still haven't had any support. So it wasn't a, really a very positive time there. Um, on the flip side, my son, who, who I thought would struggle because homework's always been a real battle and he's not well organised, he's not well structured, um, actually thrived during COVID. So a really weird split of responses. Um, he just became a little bit more relaxed um, and that was huge. Um, I mean, we had to do all the we set him up, he's got a shed next door. Um, so he's got his own workspace. We had to do his timetable for him. We had to um, really regiment his whole day, um, but he he thrived by it. Um, but I have put on the bottom of there because everything was done by us. There was, we didn't get any support really um, to keep this all going. Okay, Julie.
second ago. There we go. Not too far. <laughs> I'm going to have to make it up in a minute, Julie. Okay, I'm going to try and remember what's on the slide. That, um, Sorry, is that the next one? Ah, there we are. Can we? No. No? No, you need to go back, back at that. That's it. That one. Yeah, super. Sorry. Okay, so I'm going to whiz through this. What what have we learned? Um, for my daughter, intelligence isn't the key to succeeding in education. Um, I think that was a real eye-opener for me. She's a really, really intelligent girl, and it wasn't, wasn't helping. Um, she's desperately searching for a place in the world. She's very, very aware that she's been mistreated and walked all over and hasn't got friends and everything like that um on the other side um my son he needs structure he needs routine um but he can work independently and that was a big shock for me but um but then equally really for his wider world that what i got used to of his shut off self that i call it that's not normal and it was really eye-opening to actually see that that's not normal him. That's a response to his environment. And that's really been positive to, to see that and see the deterioration when he went back to school. Um, so it really was school dependent. Um, do you want to move on, Julie? Because I'm probably aware of time. So we were asked to look at what changes there should be in schools to operate um, and to education more generally. Now, <laughs> there was going to be a really, really long list, um, but I have tried to keep it down to a minimum. So if we go on to the next slide. So um, teach training needs to include much, 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 much more um, difference of ability awareness. Um, they, provision for it at the moment just isn't anywhere near good enough. Um, I've put schools should have to teach a diversity subject. And now this is probably a little bit, I've got it whole planned out in my head from right from key stage one to key stage four. Um, but I think there should be a subject specifically looking at how people are different and including everything in there, not just disability, but um, everything. Um, schools need to become far more advanced with computer aided technology. They are so behind the times um, and kids are getting are missing out because of it. Um, schools and doctors need to recognise that academics aren't everything. I'm sick of being told that they're fine. At, they're getting on at school. And so I've put on there that literally this month I've been told by a doctor that my son can't have autism because he's achieving at school. It's so, mm. Schools need to recognise they do not know their child better than their parents. That's a real bugbear as a parent. Julie, you want to skip on to the next one? Sorry. Ah. That's okay. it. Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> no, funding systems. As a, um, a university student, the funding for disabled students at university is brilliant. You get you get told. You tell them what you need and they provide it. But all the way up through education, up until then, there's nothing. And there really needs looking at of how some sort of comparability can work. Um, and I've got like six seconds left. So I'm going to skip down to the bottom one as a past Senko. Senkos must be part of the senior leadership team, otherwise it doesn't work. Done. Thank you so much, Barbara. And I'm really sorry to mess your slides around. This seems to have a life of its own um, when you're coordinating with other, other things. Um, I'd like to move us straight on to Sarah King. And Sarah, please take the floor. Thanks very much. Can you go to the next slide, please, Julie? Um, Thanks very much for having me to speak today. I'm going to share our personal and um, family experience of COVID and the impact on us. Um, my husband and I have two sons. They're both autistic. I've got one in secondary school and one in primary. 
they don't have an EHCP plan, either of them. So they weren't in school in lockdown one. Um, my husband works full time and I work from home part time and study part time. I'm autistic um, and this typically works well for me for sensory reasons and for our childcare. Could you move on to the next one, please, Julie? So um, prior to lockdown, when we could see this was starting to come, we were quite good with the planning. We, we put lots of plans in place, made sure we followed the rules and recognised really how fortunate we, we were. Um, I know some people weren't in the same situation, but we, you know, we had some equipment, we had outside space and we were already both geared up to work from home. We arranged workstations for the children and I changed my working pattern to allow for homeschooling and my employers were, were very flexible and amazing actually. Um, I developed schedules for the family so we could manage work and schooling and other activities and we spent a lot of time talking to the children to explain what was happening. Um, we bought a plastic greenhouse which was a lifesaver um, just to have some, some something to do outside for all of us and, and for me to hide in on occasion as well. And next slide please Julie. So this slide is how I felt a lot of the time um, in lockdown. Ironically, this is a time when lots of people were talking about making the most of calm and solitude and enjoying the peace. And actually, I had everything that was usually outside of the home, inside the home in terms of having children and, and my husband here and everything going on. Um, we also had lots of information coming in. We have two schools to, to deal with. Plus, plus our jobs, plus the university course, the amount of um, information coming in was immense. Um, similar to Barbara, we were on our own really with sorting everything out and getting organised. The boys were anxious, they were worried about COVID itself, um, worried about the amount of change that happened very quickly um, and really with no clear idea about when it would get, go back to normal and obviously we weren't able to tell them that. When we, uh, the, our first day of lockdown, we went out for our daily walk and a neighbour shouted at us because we were playing Pokemon, which is something that my son does to really calm himself down. And he refused to go out for a week. And that's the impact it had on him. Just somebody, you know, we, we weren't doing anything wrong. We were doing something legitimate. We did have some real bonus moments, um, family football and baking and, and time learning together with the children. And that was really nice. So there were some, some good parts. Next one, please. So it was very different experiences for us, for, for my primary school child and my secondary. Um, this time really gave us insight into each of our children and how they worked best. For my primary age child, he needed my input for much of the time when he was involved in the work that was set from school. It was really good to have a plan and a schedule, but it had to change as quite quickly he realised that the work that was set for him each week wasn't going to be looked at by a teacher. There was no online learning or interaction from, from primary school. We have a huge file containing unmarked work. And for him, this was completely pointless and illogical. And he started to find it, understandably, frustrating and boring. Um, so we um, went our own way with it. I set him research projects based on his own interests, but incorporating elements of schooling. Um, he was absorbed then and happy for hours and the work was joyful and meaningful for him, not just going through the motions. It really a play to his strengths, allowed for in-depth focus, but it took me time to plan in. And once I've got him set up, he was uh, able to self-study for hours, which was a huge difference from the set work where he just needed me with him. We shared some of that with school and had feedback and that made him feel more connected and validated his work. And more importantly, he enjoyed it and learned loads. And one thing I kept hearing for everybody was it, it's difficult for everyone. Well, yes, of course it, it was, but surely those difficulties are relative and therefore even more difficult for those who already have challenges, perhaps with transition, sensory differences, communication. Why would the fact it was difficult um, for everyone suddenly make it a level playing field? I found that bewildering. For my older son, secondary school seemed much more geared up with online ways of working and my son's very organised and motivated. For most of the lessons that were factual in content with clear instructions, he completed the work very quickly and easily by himself. Some topics, the ones that, such as uh, that were more creative, such as English language, he found challenging and it was much harder for the teachers to check in with him and he found it di more difficult to explain what help he needed. So this became quite problematic and on several occasions he got extremely distressed and we had to, to support him. 
Um, I helped by translating instructions and advocating. We were offered uh, um, some CAT support but, and gave our information for that, but actually that, that didn't happen. I guess they were overloaded. He has a counsellor at school um, and this was able to continue doing time at home and that was really reassuring. I think school staff had an enormous challenge, but I think some of the children got left behind for those in our situation with no e e EHCP plan, but with additional needs because obviously they weren't allowed to go into school. And the ongoing changes in the rules are, are more stressful than the original lockdown, I think. There's so much unknown and so much change that's been more challenging to manage than right at the start when it was very clear what we had to do and what we couldn't. Next slide, please, Julie. So if COVID has shown us nothing else, it's proven that we can do things really differently in a very short space of time, especially utilising technology where we can. Um, why, why do we go through a diagnostic pathway to identify that autistic children have specific differences? And this can take months and years, and Barbara alluded to that. And then we spend all our time trying to teach them how to think and work like neurotypical children. It's just not logical. Um, so surely it makes much more sense for everyone and not just autistic people. If we accept and work with difference and allow flexibility in how we work, we do this at work when we're in, in, our, in our roles as adults, we, when we're building teams, we play to people's strengths, recognizing skills and strengths. Um, and then perhaps people don't work with the things they're not so great with, but in schools, we have some way to go before we, we start talking about neurodiversity and accepting it. I absolutely agree with Barbara with her points about funding and training and positioning of the SEND team um, and also about DSA support. Um, my experience of, of university has been really positive, but if children are not supported in school, they might not make it to HE. So um, something to bear in mind. Given the finance, financial situation at the moment, it's possible that financial challenges that we have will worsen for education providers. The more funding needs to be invested in SEND and suitable resources. Um, my, my children worked better when I completely changed that whole approach um, and in a way that allowed them to, to sort of absorb and follow their own instincts for learning. Uh, and I think that's great for creativity and self-esteem. Um, and I think it's really important to work with strengths and interests. I also want to point out that um, needs aren't preferences. Uh, in some cases with my children, once the support is working, it's been suggested that the teacher will then stop that then. Perhaps it's too time consuming. And I'd like people to think about glasses, which might be needed all of the time once they've been identified as a need, as opposed to stabilizers, which can help you learn to ride a bike and then be taken away. Um, sometimes this, the glasses approach might be needed. And also I'd really like people to understand that a parent may be autistic and have their own needs for additional information, different communication preferences to support their child. Next slide, please. It's the last one. I've just got a couple of words to share. These are final words from my children and I, they've given me their permission to share. The first one is my oldest son. And this was something he said to me every day about his difficulties with advocating. I can't explain. And my other child, uh, used the words to explain how he was feeling. I don't feel real. So no. I hope that sums that up for you. And thanks very much. It really does, Sarah. Thank you. That's absolutely wonderful. And we'll move on swiftly to Sharon, Sharon Smith. Thank you. Hello. Um, just want to say in advance, I've not undertaken any um, specific COVID re related research myself. So I'm going to be mainly drawing on a range of material um, from other surveys and research that has explored parents' perspectives and also my own personal lived experience as a parent of a 15-year-old who has Down syndrome in a mainstream school. So within this image, my daughter is holding a photo of a piece of artwork that is going to be submitted next summer for a GCSE art. Her theme was about um, friendships in lockdown and this image shows how completely isolated and separate and I think it's a useful visual metaphor that represents the experiences that many parents have reported for their children and I'm going to be using her artwork throughout this presentation to illustrate my slides. Uh, next slide please Julie. Oops sorry. So um, within this presentation, I'm going to show that parents' perspectives of education during COVID have been really mixed, and I think we've seen that already. Um, some report that their child has thrived, whether at home or within the education that was provided in schools during lockdown. 
but other families have um, reported the opposite, describing how they felt utterly abandoned during this period, with their children having a poor experience of education, which has left the family having to pick up the pieces. And there has been an enormous disparity in the support that has been given to pupils who have special educational needs, but it's unclear as to what has caused this disparity in both the quantity and quality of education that's been provided. So some schools have adapted and supported the education of those who have special educational needs really well, but others haven't. And what appears to be evident is that the COVID crisis um, appears to be exposing existing inequalities and the exclusion of some children with special educational needs. Next slide, please, Julie. Thank you. Um, so on this um, picture, there are two clay figures um, that my daughter has made, and the figures are both wearing face masks. So the parent-led um, website, Special Needs Jungle, undertook a parent survey. And the responses showed only 18% of parents said that their child's school provided enough support for their child to complete their work. Fewer than one in seven reported that their child received any online learning support. And some parents reported that their child received no work at all. If work was received, it was frequently not suitably differentiated. And even when online lessons and learning materials were provided, either by schools or national platforms such as the Oak Academy, which was launched at this time, they're not always inclusive of disabled students. So, for instance, there might not be differentiation of content, BSL interpretation might be missing, audio descriptions, etc. So, as a result, many parents have reported that they felt really abandoned at this time and their children have felt cut off and ignored. Next slide, please. So um, just to describe the image, my daughter here is making the clay figures for her art project. So at the same time, it's also clear from research um, with parents that some children and young people were a lot happier at home, and we've already heard this today. For those who find school a highly pressurised environment, being at home was actually a massive relief. They felt safer, less anxious, and more able to spend time with their family. Of course, at home, there's no bullying, no uncomfortable uniform, not necessarily any sensory overload, no fixed timetable, and a lot of pupils felt happier interacting in the online environment or at home, which they see as their happy place. They can take breaks when they're needed, and they've got freedom to learn in different ways and develop independence. Another parent group, Reaching Families, report 21% of parents who responded to their parent survey said that their children were significantly more relaxed during lockdown and 15% were sleeping a lot better. So what we can see is that some children being removed from a stressful environment and potentially exclusionary school environment have managed to actually engage more with their learning and it's actually had a really positive impact on their well-being. Next slide, please. And um, so this image is two clay hands that my daughter made. Um, Again, there are alternative perspectives. Being at home has been really difficult for some children. Reaching families described how parents said that their children had struggled to make the transition to learning at home. And they see home and school as entirely separate zones. Home is home and school is school. And they struggled with the fact that their, the place they saw as their safe place was now being the place they had to do schoolwork, which sometimes they find more difficult. Additionally, parents have raised concerns that their children were um, suffering from significant anxiety, um, mental health problems, and also some behavioural problems, including, in some cases, children becoming more violent. And these issues had escalated the further uh, we went through lockdown. And additionally, the lack of routine, which again has already been mentioned, um, the lack of structure and peer interaction were very challenging for a number of students. Parents were concerned about the lack of social interaction that their children were having, with fewer opportunities for conversations, turn-taking, sharing and group activities at home. Next slide, please. Um, it's important for us to recognise that um, children with EHCPs and those with social, social workers who were classed as a vulnerable cohort were, of course, able to attend school during lockdown. And to represent this, I've got an image of seven clay people that my daughter um, has made. 
So although this provision was available, um, many parents chose to keep their children at home during, um, during lockdown due to safety concerns or because their children were already struggling to attend school pre-COVID. But those children who did attend in this vulnerable provision actually reported really positive experiences. They said that they benefited from um, smaller class sizes, increased one-to-one -one time with teachers and the opportunity to build better relationships. There were relaxed uniform requirements which were welcomed and they were also separated from children who had previously bullied them. Julie, could we skip on two slides, please? So this um, is just very quickly why I want to explain this, this picture. Prior to lockdown, my daughter's school um, were allowing her to sit in on a GCSE art class, but they didn't think she could actually achieve the art qualification. But during um, lockdown, we realised that in her art book, a lot of the work had been done by her TA. And at home, what we did was differentiated her artwork. We found accessible ways for her to access art that were not about her having to um, complete really fine drawings. And we used the clay models. And as a result, the art teacher has actually contacted us post lockdown. We've had an amazing discussion um, about actually the fact that she's going to be able to um, hopefully undertake an art GCSE next summer. Mm. This has led to a conversation with the art teacher about how the teaching assistant has supported my daughter um, prior to lockdown. And um, we've decided uh, together that actually she will now step away, but the teacher is going to be able to differentiate the work and choose artists for the whole class that hopefully my daughter will be able to access. And we're hoping as a result next summer, she will be able to um, actually get GCSE qualification. Next slide, please, Julie. So final thoughts. Um, I don't have any answers. Um, I'm not a teacher. I'm not an educator. I'm a parent. And my PhD research is looking at parents' experiences of education and inclusion. But I've got some questions. So why was it some schools were able to um, continue to support and adapt to educate children well and others didn't? Was it simply shining a light on existing exclusion within, ex in, within inclusion for some children? Um, I'm concerned that the new vulnerable label has led to a further separation and exclusion for some children. But I think that there are some real opportunities here to look at the children who either thrived at home or in the vulnerable provision to understand how inclusion can work better. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sharon. And again, a, an absolutely wonderful and thought provoking presentation. And our last doctoral student is Shardia Palmer. So Shardia, please. Um, good evening all and uh, thank you for having me here. So I'm going to take my um, doctoral researcher's hat off and, and put my mommy hat on. Um, so I have a son, my son who's eight years old, um, he was seven at the time during the lockdown, um, is autistic, but I also have a three-year-old, which I feel is extremely important to my experience because he doesn't stop existing um, just because we're on lockdown and he's part of the family. Um, I myself have multiple sclerosis and um, dyslexia. So I, I share this with you because similarly to the other speakers, I think that um, kind of what we, what all the family members were bringing into the, the, the circumstances really does matter to see how you were dealing with um, the news, anxiety, lockdown, you know, um, and so on and so forth. And, you know, during lockdown, it was both my husband and I, we weren't furloughed. I'm a university lecturer as well. So um, universities kept going in regards to exams and marking. Um, my husband's an accountant, so he had to keep going in regards to furloughing other staff and so on. Um, and so we were still expected to work um, as best as we could, which basically was to full capacity, but also educate both of our children. Um, so we ended up putting double shifts. So that was, you know, doing the schoolwork during the day and in the evening, um, trying to catch up on those emails and what was expected. Um, the impact that COVID had on the education to my children is, first of all, one is eight and one is three, and they have a completely different, you know, level of education and expectation that in itself was really hard to jump from nursery level education to you know your key stage three university university um lecture that jumped to kind of 
your HE education and so on in one day, sometimes within an hour, um, was quite difficult to process. Um, and then also to, to kind of to demonstrate and articulate. Um, and, you know, it, it became an issue where we found and my son found a lot of the work from the school was very on screen heavy, tech heavy. And even a situation like this, doing a Zoom and the teacher had um, the, the lessons through Zooms, he really struggled with that setup. Um, maybe because it wasn't managed great from the teacher. But when, you, when you're when you on Zoom and whoever's talking moves around the screen and you can hear all the children, it really sent him into a, re a bad place. And uh, straight after I had to contact the teacher and say, he cannot do that again. That does not work for him at all. Um, so we didn't, so he didn't um, participate in any Zooms after that, which again started to isolate him. It just became um, too much in that circumstance. So then we kind of, my husband and I made a decision to withdraw from what the school was offering, which was very little for him specifically, and kind of focus on maths and English, but take it off um, the screen and do more practical things. And we ended up, you know, in the garden with the chalk. Um, we ended up doing a lot of um, uh, dough work and cutting and sticking, but also, you know, doing his English still and, and maths the same way. And I take from the whole experience quite a positive one, now I can say that. During it, it was quite traumatic for, for many of us. And I say that because of the lessons that we learned um, during the, the lockdown, the first one. And in the lesson that I, I wanna bring to the forefront is, my son is more than capable. He's actually very capable of doing the, the work and achieving the learning outcomes that the curriculum would like him to achieve. However, if he has to follow a set way a set criteria of getting to the end then he does struggle but if he's allowed to use his differences in the way that he learns um to be able to say you know what i can do it then it works and an example of that is um he had to, one of the one of the homeworks he was given was that he had to um describe the thoughts and the feelings of some characters which is quite abstract to him, thoughts and feelings, that in itself, you know, for autistic children is quite difficult. And he was supposed to write it, extended writing, and, you know, write a page, if not a page and a half. And we just struggled and it became agonizing. It was quite warm during the lockdown as well. So I says to him, we sat there and I spoke to him and we had a conversation and I filmed it. And that's what I sent to the teacher, his verbal response to what she was asking. And um, she emailed back saying, that was absolutely fine. And I thought, so why do you make him and force him to sit down and then also comment that his piece of paper is still blank when actually you could just verbally ask him and he's more than capable of answering your question. So, um, you know, it's examples like that, that my husband and I started to learn more about his condition. He was diagnosed last year and it's almost like, you know, your child is um, on the spectrum, thank you and goodbye. And we, since last year, we haven't really had time or, or the capacity to understand and educate ourselves on the condition that our son has and how, you know, us as a family are going to work together. So lockdown positively gave us that space to understand him, his condition, um, you know, how autism becomes part of all of our lives within our, within our household. Um, and then also what the lockdown enabled us to do is look at how we are working with our son within our home and what we could do and you know like many of us amazon became our best friend and mm -hmm. um you know we started to where everyone else was panicking ordering um, hand sanitizer we were ordering bubble wrap um and you know velcro sticky velcro things and starting to create a more sensory space within our home which we didn't have before and i think if if lockdown didn't happen we wouldn't have the had the time to stop and analyze our home to say actually it's not suitable for our son and his need but the changes that i would like to see going forward within education and from the government is the same way my son was able to answer the question that was expected from him you know we need to education needs to open up this very tight box that it puts in front of a lot of young people um, and with the, the, the technological advances and kind of the advances we've made in diversity, you know, education at the moment, along with the curriculum, um, 
but also the methods of assessment need to change. Um, we need to start assessing young people, children in a different way and stop forcing them to, to continue with this linear way that we've been doing for, for centuries. It's quite, it's outdated, it doesn't work. It's not reflecting the students that you have in front of you. So my message to the government, education or schools is that, you know, allow our children to shine and please stop disabling them. Thank you. Thank you so much, Shardia. And again, lots of food for thought and some very clear messages about what governments and schools might do. I'm going to move us straight on to the next presenter. Um, and this is Simon Wallace. And Simon, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. And, and thanks to Julie and to Karen for asking me to present some of our data this evening. So this is a, a project that was led by Karen uh, and involved a, a number of colleagues. And it, it really came at a point over the summer where we felt there's something that we could be doing in parents who have children on the autism spectrum in terms of how they were managing during the COVID lockdown. So the next slide, please. So we uh, sent a survey out to parents who have children on the autism spectrum um, up to the age of 25. And we were interested in a number of areas. And this evening, I'm just going to present uh, some data in terms of what we found in terms of education, but we also asked about um, mental health and uh, their particular thoughts about the future of education as well. We did have a short turnaround in terms of the project, and I think it would have been nice if we'd been able to capture directly the opinions of autistic children and young people, and that may be something that we can do and focus on in the future. And I'm going to talk at the end about how we used some of the data to develop a resource for, for teaching staff. Um, so next slide, please. So we had um, 294 um, parents and caregivers that we could use in the final data set. It was pretty representative um, of the UK population. The average age of the kids was around 11 and a half years. As, as has been mentioned before, I, I think we're becoming more aware of is that it's often more than one person uh, on the autism spectrum in a household, which I think is important, particularly around COVID. Um, most of the parents and caregivers who respond had kids in uh, mainstream settings, and around half had an education healthcare plan. And obviously, as we probably are quite aware now, is that a lot of parents were home educating their kids, even if they did have a, uh, an EHCP. Okay, next slide, please. So one of the things that we wanted to know, and as I said, we're going to focus on in, in the presentation is really how school did. And it's been interesting to hear um, from the parents who have uh, kids on the autism spectrum about this mixed experience. And that's, in a nutshell, very much what I think we found is that it was kind of split. If it was a question, it was 50-50, it was often 50-50. If it was split three ways, it was a third, a third, a third. It was very divided up like that. Um, and uh, one of the questions that I think represents that is we asked, how well were the changes to your child's schooling managed when, you, when lockdown first occurred? And um, some were saying that it was done very well. And we heard some really nice examples of good practice about bringing families into that initial period of lockdown. And then others who really felt that they got no support at all. Um, around half of, our, of the schools did send information home early on so that the child could understand about COVID and lockdown but there was three quarters of, of parents and caregivers who said actually that information wasn't useful. I think a number of respondents that we have were quite aware that this was a very challenging time for school, but I think they felt that that initial period, the information wasn't really forthcoming. 
um, then the majority of respondents did, as you can expect, did have ongoing contact with teaching staff during lockdown. Um, but actually, again, thinking about this divide, it was very mixed in terms of how useful the um, respondents felt that was. Next slide, please. Moving on to what school did offer. So when we looked at the respondents who provided home education, I, I think 37% is, is quite a high figure in terms of them receiving no additional materials to support education. And um, for those who did receive something, it was mainly worksheets and textbooks. And I think one of the things when we looked at the question about what parents were looking for, it was often quite simple things like paper, uh, the ability to print things. So it wasn't really, really um, complex things that they were asking for. Obviously, technology was a big thing in terms of home education during the COVID period. Um, and, and there you have the figures as the types of things that, that parents were receiving. I think we did find probably about a 50-50 split in terms of parents and caregivers who were saying that they did have challenges in terms of accessing uh, the technology. I think simple things like the home may have one or two computers, but if mum and dad are working, plus you have two kids who are having to access things online, that obviously adds a, a complication. Um, we didn't find a high percentage in terms of this idea that's already been mentioned about individualizing the uh, curriculum for the child and um, what we did see was that those families where their child had an EHCP in place were more likely to have better support from the schools so they managed the lockdown better they provided more regular um, communication and additional materials to support them okay next slide please okay we, we asked them a bit about what they would like in, in terms of the future as they were trend, and we asked them also about that transition period back into school. I think broadly speaking, respondents were quite positive about going back to school. I think a lot of parents were obviously relieved that this period may be coming to an end, and I think a lot of children were, were looking forward to going back, not universal, but a good, good percentage. We also asked them about, after this experience, whether they would be willing to have school lessons at home in the future and, and again we see that kind of kind of split um next slide please i'll just finish off um in terms of what i think we would take from it there is this i think sense from a lot of the respondents that schools could have done more um and a lot of these things have been mentioned al already but i think providing contact and support that is regular but also scheduled and, and some parents said that you know they would have it booked in and then it wouldn't happen and they'd have to shift and move um, and pastoral support came up a lot in terms of, uh, of parents responding positively to that so just the last last slide um, is what we did at the end and I'll just draw your attention to that so that's going to come out hopefully in the next week or so but we um, produced some videos and thank you to Shadi and Barbara who took part in those videos where we captured um, some nice personal examples of, of experience of families during lockdown and we've got this guide as well for teachers called the good the bad and the helpful where it talks about some of the positives some of the negatives but also what we think are quite good recommendations for teachers uh, as this COVID um, pandemic carries on. That's Thank you so much, Simon. That was a fantastic account of this really important research and it resonates with much of what the doctoral students have reported as their very own experiences. So that's wonderful. And we move on to our final presenter and that's Clara Jorgensen. Clara, please. Thank you. Yeah. So I'm also, oh, just before you go oh, into that, oh, yeah. So I was also, I'm also going to share a bit of findings from a survey that was sent out to parents and carers during the lockdown uh, from the School of Education. 
So if you wanna, yeah, move on to the next slide. So just a little bit of background about the survey. Um, the survey went out to parents and carers in, gen in general, and it was um, developed by a team at the School of Education led by Deborah Udell in collaboration with Birmingham City Council. So for this survey, there was uh, 313 parents, carers responding who together had 463 uh, children and of them, 68 children were considered by their parents or school as having a special educational needs. So this will be the group that I'm kind of focusing on in, in the next uh, few minutes. So within that group, the largest uh, primary special educational need of disability was autism. In terms of uh, gender, there was a majority of boys, uh, ethnicity, also a majority of children described as uh, white. And in general, we could see in the whole sample, but also for this particular subgroup, the parents were relatively well educated um, within that, um, yeah, in terms of who, who responded to this survey. So next slide, please. So I would say the main outcome of uh, having looked at these um, 68, or the responses of parents of these 68 children was very, very similar to what people have been saying already, a, a hugely diverse response. So just to give two examples, um, parents were asked overall how satisfied they were with their children's school provision. We had an almost even split here. Um, and then also they asked uh, how satisfied they were with their children's learning. Again, a very um, even split. So 25 saying extremely or somewhat dissatisfied, 29 extremely or somewhat satisfied. And also the qualitative responses uh, included in the survey revealed a similarly very mixed picture. So some of the parents were saying the children found the material way too easy, others were saying it was way too challenging or hard. There was an issue of access, uh, some of you have mentioned already in terms of uh, digital learning and online um, meetings and so on. So there was some stuff around that where someone mentioning it was, it was too hard to access. And really just a very varied impact on children and parents, which I think depends you know, on so many different intersecting factors. So really hard to say anything uh, very general, but I would say, and uh, could you, the next slide please, Julie, that there were some challenges where I think it's, it's really important to highlight these because it did show that some of these children actually uh, compared to the total sample were having some, um, additional challenges. So according to the parents, carers who were asked for the survey, and I think it's, it's important to mention that this was the parents, carers views and not the children. Um, but they were reporting that their children um, were more likely to find the materials sent by schools too hard. So quite a different, big difference from the total sample, 28 versus 10%. Um, a higher percentage of children were also reported to never have found learning at home interesting and never engaging enthusiastically with the work set for them. So I think that also uh, relates back to what Simon was talking about, actually about the diversity in what school were sending. So there's some interesting uh, links there. Um, and then finally thinking a bit more maybe about the mental health side, I think there's also some really worrying numbers here, which were that a higher percentage of these children were reported as being upset or worried about the work most of the time, uh, as never having fun, and as being uh, lonely most of the time. In the week, it has to be said, this was in the week prior to the survey being sent out. So really some, um, some challenges mentioned here. Uh, next slide, please. So what I thought to just think about, and this is maybe thinking a bit ahead, um, Again, I wouldn't say I have any particular answers or recommendations, but it does, I think, raise some really important questions. So first of all, of course, what are the more long-term impacts of these um, reported challenges? Now that schools have been back for most students around three months, how has all this worked out? Um, you know, and then particularly, I think, interesting in terms of um, social distancing measures within schools, I think there was also some findings in this survey where parents were being asked about the, um, their thoughts about going back to school uh, that we could think about in relation to what's going on in schools now. So for example, some of them were mentioning um, that they were worried that children wouldn't be able to deal with these new social distancing measures. They would be too stressful. They would 
become anxious. So really what's happening now that uh, most children are back at school with these measures, uh, really important to do some follow up, I think. Some of them also talked about worries that their children wouldn't get the one to one to one support they uh, needed. And again, I don't know how it's going now, but I think that's really important to, to um, follow up on that as well. And then something that's been mentioned before as well um, around smaller groups. So, for example, when some children were going back, we had these smaller groups. Uh, but obviously, I guess most children are now in their regular um, classes. But is it a potentially more manageable setting with smaller groups? Or what about limited social interaction across groups? Some of those diverse effects. And then the final thing, just I think it's important to emphasize, is that even though most children are back at school, actually, we still have a much more fluid school home um, situation with children potentially regularly self-isolating or schools closing for, for small um, periods of time. So how does that work for different groups of children, including those with uh, special educational needs? So these were just some questions I thought kind of arose from this uh, survey, but I would say that in general, many of our findings resonate really well with what people have said already. So I think the diversity and the need for flexibility and those kind of things would be supported by, by this work as well. Great, thank you so much, Clara. And thank you to all the participants for really excellent presentations. I'm just stopping sharing the slides now. And we move into the discussion part of this session. But I'd just like to say that it has been utterly fascinating to hear these experiences and to hear some learning that many of those of you who are parents have experienced some discoveries about your children's potential that hadn't been seen before, but also some real recognition of the limitations of things that are being done by schools and questioning on your part of why things are being done the way they are. And, you know, I think Shadia's comment about the need for education to open up from this very tight box is quite profound. And this is a moment for us to, to think about doing things differently. And we also heard from these really interesting research studies, which have confirmed and affirmed some of these experiences. So very, very interesting indeed. And as I say, we turn to the discussion prompted from the question and answer um, discussion board. Can I ask Maria and Annie to direct us to any particular questions that we might ask the panelists to answer? Um, uh, yes, so, so after Sarah's presentation, we have a comment, a reflection. Uh, I was wondering if a lot more awareness programs uh, via media would help to create a more understanding society. Mm -hmm. Okay, so who would like to answer that? Anyone, just jump in, please. Yes, um, I think um, we talk about, particularly for autism, obviously there's, there's, there's um, uh, we're talking about other issues here too, but um, I'd like to see not just autism awareness, I'd like to have autism understanding. Um, and, and that's a, a, a sort of deeper, deeper thing really. Um, and, and I think there's a lot of training out there, but I, th I think it needs to be um, led by autistic people um, and, and a mix of autistic people as well with, with, with sort of different experiences to share. Um, so yes. Okay, thanks. Barbara, yeah. we're going to... Yeah, I, to I totally agree. I think, um, I think there is a hesitation that um, like, big social media campaigns and that sort of thing can um, sometimes make light of it a little bit. So I think there's a there's a delicacy around it. Um, but I agree that training and awareness and understanding, yeah, is um, really important. <laughs> I always remember when I was at school, we um, there was the odd sock day 
um, that was supposed to be awareness raising. And I always remember an autistic lad turning around to me and going, what's that got to do with autism? What's wearing on socks going to help? And I think it, I can understand why they're there and why they're happening. But I think sometimes they miss, miss the point a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and I agree, having more autistic people out there Again, at school, we used to get the um, the children training the teachers, and that was such a big impact. And training their peers, and that and that made such a big impact. So, mm. really getting the voices out there is really important. Mm. Great, thanks. Yeah. For this comment, Barbara, Maria, or Annie, would you like to direct us to another question? Um. Yes, it has been answered by Clara's presentation. That's what the attendee commented later, but I'm just going to mention mm -hmm. uh, one thing that worries me as a parent within the COVID context is the mental health impact that this situation will have on the long term for the children and how to support them now to minimize the impact of further mental health issues in the future. So any tips would be great, greatly appreciated. My child is seven and autistic. Mm. Yeah. Great question and comment, and indeed Clara did go on <laughs> to um, focus on, on much of that, but would any of the panellists like to comment further on this really important area? I, I think I would like to just say a little bit, because I've been thinking quite a lot about this as well. I think there's been a lot of focus on catching up with learning and things like that, but I think for all children, the mental health and schools really explicitly dealing with that is really, really important. And I think, I mean, I have two kids myself who've been obviously home during lockdown and now back at school. And it, it's a completely different social setting coming back and trying getting back into things. And I think that's just alongside the impact on learning, we really need a strong impact on um, friendships and how we kind of start them up again or how different children uh, feel within that new setting and also as I mentioned going back and forth potentially self-isolating for periods and and things like that so I, I just it's not really an answer but it's just emphasizing that alongside uh, the learning yeah great point yeah I think it's about um recognition I guess for me mental health is a huge issue in my household at the moment um, and it's about recognizing that or but making it valid those feelings and sort of accepting it and sort of going we we know we haven't got the answers um, my eight-year-old as well is really struggling at the moment because he he doesn't understand um, I think someone said earlier about lockdown one was easier because it was structured and it was it, there was lots around it um, he's just had to self-isolate from school again um, and has struggled far more this time around because he doesn't understand why um, it doesn't make any sense to him. Um, so I think it's just about discussing that and accepting that actually lots of people haven't got the answers and um, it is different and it is new, but we're going to we're going to learn together and we're going to look at it and we're going to investigate and, and just mm -hmm. sort of, I guess, support each other as best we can. Mm. Yeah. I wanted to, sorry, I wanted to add as well that I think it's this is where um, us as parents and teachers and professionals come in because it's about spotting it as well and that we need to know the children that we're working with, that we're living with, um, so that when they step out of whatever their norm is, that we mm. notice that there's a change in that child or there's a difference um, and then having that connection with the school and that's where that home, home link work really comes into play for us to be able to spot it quick, quickly before we, um, anything kind of escalates and and also making sure that you know children with special ed educational needs specifically don't go um, you know they don't slip through the radar because I think as a nation um, many of our children are going to suffer because of what we've all just gone through this year and still going through and when when they um when the government will present kind of national support or initiatives, we need to just make sure that children with special educational needs are getting a specific mention and not coming under the category and therefore getting um, <clears throat> getting missed basically for their special their special educational needs. Mm. That's a great point. Are there any further points relating to mental health and that focus? 
Yes, please, Simon. Um, it, it's just around uh, anxiety, which is obviously an enormous um, issue in terms of autism. And we asked the parents and caregivers in the survey about levels of anxiety pre and then during lockdown. And we found that about 30% of respondents were saying that their child was classified as extremely anxious pre-lockdown. And, and that's, that group is where we saw the greatest shift. So that percentage halved almost during that lockdown period. And I think for a lot of the respondents and for, for their children, it was this idea of such relief from those daily stresses and pressures that they were, were seeing. I think the other thing to point out, we also asked about loneliness and friendships. Um, and I think there is this kind of myth to some degree about um, lack of interest in others in, in autism and lack of desire to build social relationships. And we also heard this in, in an earlier survey we did this year around education exclusion. But I think it highlights the importance for some children on the autism spectrum about how important those social relationships are. And we, with a certain percentage, around 40%, 40 to 50%, we were hearing that they were lonely and they were really missing their kids. And that was one of the big calls for them to go back into schools to see their, their friends. Mm. Great point, Simon, thank you. Annie, and Maria, and or Maria, would you like to take us to any further questions in the Q&A? There is one that kind of leads on from what you've been talking about, which is about um, suggestions for ways to differentiate, differentiate teaching and learning um, and suggestions both, you know, from teaching at home, but also in the school setting too. Mm. Yeah, lovely question. So who would like to answer that? Sarah, are you signalling? Please. Yeah. Um, I think I'm not an educator. I've not ever been a teacher. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that I can provide advice about um, doing this in, a, in a, a school setting, but certainly from home. Um, what I really saw a huge difference, particularly with my primary age son, um, just by being led by his own extreme interests he's got um for example um uh, he was really struggling one day and didn't want to do any of the set work and he had a real interest in louis armstrong just one song um so what i did I, I just said to him go and find out everything you can or everything you want to about louis armstrong you can either do it by listening to the music and telling me about it or you can um make me a presentation or you can show me a picture just go and do whatever you like learn whatever you like about him in any way you can then just come back and tell me when you're ready five hours later <laughs> he appeared back with a, a um a full presentation that he'd made about louis armstrong's life he played me several of his tracks he'd chosen his favorite one uh, and he'd put that where well, he, he just hadn't stopped um so for me it was uh, it was really powerful to see when he was self-directed in his learning, just what a difference that made. The rest of the time when I was working with the, the work that had been set, it was, he really struggled to mm. engage with it and to focus. So I, I, suppose, I suppose where I'm going with this is find the link, find that connection with, with an interest of, of in some way. Um, and there's something to be said for natural flow here as well. I think particularly with, with my children, um, they work at their at their own pace in their own time and they're very hard workers but they need to be allowed to to do that in in their own time and I, I worry and wonder how that works for them in school with bells and time limits they've just got into something and they're having to stop so I'd be really interested to see some research about how, how the difference of double lessons as opposed to single uh, you know wh whether there's a way to change the the timing and the structure I mean it's, that's a bigger ask perhaps um I hope that made sense. <laughs> so thanks. Oh, absolutely does. And I think those uh, that language of flow and linking is a beautiful way to think about teaching. And, you know, we sometimes lose that with the bells and time constraints that we have to operate within schools. Well, we think we have to operate, but yeah. maybe we don't. Shardia, please. 
and just following on from that um, conversation about like just flowing, you know, in nursery, so obviously I've got the, the younger one, they do that, they let the children just play and flow and it's independent learning and so on. And then they get to reception and they snatch it away or they get to kind of year one and it's gone. But the children don't stop being children just because they've got to the age of five. They're still children. And I think, you know, that we can still encompass some of that with a lot of that in um, our educational system. And, you know, it's not at the fault of the, t the teachers because they're just, they're following um, guidelines and curriculums that they've been given um, but I know in regards to the curriculum it's very difficult to step out of it and still achieve all the tick boxes that they need to achieve by the end of term um, mm -hmm. so I, I think kind of I think it's something higher up that needs to come and that's why I said about changing and modernizing I think it's a, a very big ask from you know Department of Education and how is that be up there that we need a, an overhaul of the education system. It's it's outdated. It's not it's not working. But then, very controversially, maybe it is working. <laughs> nice comment. Are there any further comments on that specific point? Yes, please, Sharon. And um, yeah, I think it's um, actually potentially bigger than just differentiation. So. A lot of the parents who, um, in the studies that I looked at, have actually reported that their children didn't actually get any work at all. And um, my own personal experiences were that we received work for the first two weeks, which um, was work that the teaching assistants had already prepared in conjunction with the teachers. And then after that, we didn't receive anything. Um, and basically what happened, and I, and I think it's indicative of the, the situation in my daughter's school anyway, in that her teaching is almost um, devolved to teaching assistants. So it reminds me of some of the um, research that Rob Webster has done at UCL around the effective use of teaching assistants, but it was almost as though she became invisible and the teachers were teaching to the rest of the class and there was no differentiation. And um, in the end, I had to go on to Twinkle once a week and produce five days worth of work for her. And I'm not a teacher. Um, I had to think about different subjects. How could I move her on in those? Thinking about topics that I could actually do. So it's not just necessarily about differentiation. And what I would also just want to add, and I know I very, very briefly touched on it in my presentation, was that the Oak National Academy was um, developed, the DfE put money into that to develop online lessons and videos and actually when we tried to go and use those firstly as a parent I didn't know where to start because there were just hundreds of videos so I had to start watching them um, but also my daughter who has Down syndrome um, she was in year 10 and she knows she's in year 10 but she's working at maybe year two year three level and so for me to get the videos that were relevant to her that she could access and watch independently all of them were too young and they had teachers saying hello I'm Miss Smith and I'm your year two teacher today so I think there was just not necessarily a lot of thought put into some of those things and the teachers potentially could have sent me links to videos that were suitable to save me doing the work and having to find them they could have sent worksheets and also again I can't remember who it was but one of the other um, presenters tonight talked about how they had a big pile of work that was not marked. And we had no feedback during that whole time. And in the end, I couriered a big, basically a big cardboard box of work that my daughter had been doing during lockdown. I carried that to school and we still got no feedback on that work. And um, so I think actually differentiation is really important, obviously, but I think there is a, a wider issue that a lot of children actually became almost invisible during lockdown. Mm. Okay, thanks for that, Sharon. Could we have a further question from either Maria or Annie from the Q and A? Um, yeah, we, we've had loads of questions about um, when will be when people will be able to access the resources that Simon showed in his presentation. Karen has answered that in the chat. I don't know if Karen or Simon want to add anything. Mm -hmm. 
Clara or Simon, do you want to okay. add anything about publication? Yeah, so we, we skipped over that a, a little bit. So you can, I've put my email address. You can either email me directly or it should be up on the ACER website. Again, that link is in the chat um, in the next week or so. We're just finalising the videos as well. And I, I think it would be worth drawing people's attention to those as well because they are... We, we, we filmed 10 parents uh, and, you know, each film was about... 30 minutes and we had to edit that down to five minutes over each topic and they are extremely rich and powerful and informative as well and a lot of the things that we were just talking about differentiation we had some really beautiful examples in there about the sorts of things that parents did at home so all of that should be there hopefully touch wood in the next week and as I said my email address is there so if there's any issues Drop me an email and we'll make sure you get them. Okay, that's great. And Clara, the survey, will that be available? I'm not exactly sure of that. I would probably refer to Deb, Deborah Yudel for that uh, if someone is interested. So I don't know if we, or I can put my email, you can write me and I can look into that. Because, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I've not been involved in the whole survey. I've been involved in looking at this particular group for something we did, but I don't exactly know what. It's going to happen with the whole survey. Okay. But I'm happy to take emails and try to figure it out if someone wants to know. Thanks. Annie, Maria, do we have any more questions to feed through? You do. Um, there's one um, which is um, a concern about the ways in which schools have responded to risk the risk management impact on children. Um, with uh, special educational needs and disabilities and the increased level of fixed term exclusions. Mm -hmm. And just a, an open question really to all of the panel in terms of their responses to this and, of, and experiences of this. Okay, wonderful question. A tricky one. Who would like to venture an answer? Sharon, go for it. Okay, so um, risk is something I'm really interested in, actually. Um, and it, it is, actually, I think it's a really important question. And um, one of the things I'm interested in looking at at the moment is how it's not just necessarily about risk management, but also that sort of discourse about this being a vulnerable population as well, which is why I put that as one of my questions at the end. Um, I think that parents have been concerned that um, the risk assessment process has been put in place by the Department for Education, but actually most parents haven't been involved in that. So um, I think it was on one of my links that I posted, I think it was the special needs jungle one. It was something like over 90% of parents didn't believe that they had been actually involved in any risk assessment for their own children. Um, and also on the slide that I had to miss um, because I ran out of time, um, I also talked about how in the return to school at the moment, schools are using risk to um, stop some children returning. So they are talking about, um, for instance, children um, who need additional care needs, who then potentially um, the PPA is not the PPE is not in place or. Um, children who are causing um, potential issues around behaviour and if there, there are stricter behaviour and um, policies put in place because of COVID trying to get children to behave in certain ways and if children can't conform to that and I think there is an actual huge concern amongst parents about this and about the whole risk management process um, and it's something as I say that I've been looking at about the discourse of risk that has been increasing in special educational needs over recent years and I think that it has become really more evident during COVID so um, yeah I think that there is also I share your concern. Mm. Okay thanks Sharon for that answer. Would anyone else like to comment? No. Okay Annie or Maria do we have any more? Yes, uh, yes, we've got one for Clara. 
Um, I wonder if there are plans for a follow-up survey to look into the questions you mentioned at the end of your presentation. Not sure exactly if there's another survey, but there's ongoing work mm. in looking into potentially some of these things, but I think also more broadly. These were some questions that I kind of posed because it's been something, well, first of all, I've been thinking about, but also looking at these surveys. Like, actually, I'm quite interested in finding out what what's going on now. I think it's when, when asking parents about their concerns going back in school in June, it would be interesting to hear how they were feeling about it uh, in now. So I don't know if anyone has any comments on that. I just think um, these are more kind of my personal questions. And I think also around this um, situation now where there is a big back and forth between home and school, I think it is definitely something I would look in, like to look into, but yeah, not, not any immediate plans, I would say. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Clara. But I could perhaps mention that we have a new project starting funded by the YTL Foundation in Malaysia, um, which will support a postdoc and a PhD student to look at the ongoing impact of COVID and educational responses across the world. The idea is to share experience and good practice and learnings from um, the, the experience of COVID. And we um, have appointed both individuals, the postdoc and the PhD student, and the PhD student will actually focus on mental health, which is something that we discussed here. Um, so that's very exciting and something that we will be doing within DISSEN. Are there any more questions coming through Yes, um, we've got one um, which is noting that the focus has been mostly on the experience of um, autistic children and their families. And the question is, is this deliberate or is it perhaps where the research on the effects of COVID has been focused? Mm -hmm. um, can anyone answer that? <laughs> can have a go. Yeah. Um, I've tried um, within my presentation, firstly, I'm a parent of a child who has Down syndrome. So my experiences are mm. of being a parent who has Down syndrome. Um, but I've tried to um, look at research across a range of um, different disabilities or labels um, to actually inform the presentation that I gave tonight. So um, in terms of my perspective and what I presented, it actually wasn't just autism focused. I think there has been um, quite a bit of the research has been autism related, but there is also other research out there. So um, I mentioned the reaching families research that wasn't just for autistic children and their families. Um, there's also a study, I think, at the University of Reading, which I will try and find quickly and put into the chat um, that they, I didn't reference them in my um, references, but it's worth having a look at theirs. And I think that was broader as well. So I think there is other research out there as well, which I will try and put in the chat for you. Mm. Great, thanks, Sharon. And I wonder if some of the other presenters who are themselves autistic and have children who are autistic um, might have something to say about the particular light that can be shed um, on the general issues through a perspective of autism. I don't know if anyone has any thoughts on that. It's a tricky one. Yeah, that's a tricky one. Um, I think obviously with an autism hat on, it's, it's very easy to look at the autistic specific things. I think quite often with a special needs hat on, um, what works well, works for everybody. And I think although we can talk about the autistic child and that quite often the things that we're talking about are actually really good for all children. Um, so looking at the child's learning style, the child's processing um, speed, the child's interests. Mm -hmm. I think when um, Charlie was talking about an educational overhaul, it is about looking at diversity and looking at 
um, using these experiences to say, okay, well, this, the autistic child worked really well this way, but actually, does that translate across to other children? Are we looking at um, the experiences of uh, transgendered children? Are we looking at the experiences of um, ethnic minorities? Education is so boxed in, like you said. Um, I think we can use these experiences they are translatable I think they are it is about looking at the individual regardless of their disability what we're actually saying is let's look at the individual and how does that translate yeah that's really interesting Barbara and Sarah you talked earlier about autism understanding so is there anything you want to offer on this perspective yeah um just agreeing with with what Barbara's just said, actually, um, lots of the things that will benefit autistic people will, will, will benefit the general population, whether they have um, a difference or a disability or not. Um, it, and I think um, that's one of the things that, that I find really important. Looking at my children, um, although they both have the same diagnosis, they're actually incredibly different in terms of their, their styles and their approaches and their needs. They have some similarities, but their learning needs are a very different the way they approach things and their sensory profile is enormously different one is very sensory seeking and the other one is very sensory avoidant so where that's led me although my 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 focus is autism because um that that's that's what i know i i haven't got any expertise or experience in in um in another area and my research is related to autism um i i, I suppose it's just about um reflecting that you know, ref, reflecting on their differences has made me really think actually it is as as Barbara said it's about the individual um and that, and it's just so important I think to to keep that in mind thanks thank you very much do we have one final question that we'd like the yeah. panel to ask Annie you're you're nodding or Maria yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So there's one more um, about peer intervention. Whether uh, the question is, will a peer intervention program be helpful? Um, so yeah, that draws up on many presentations tonight. Um, yeah. Okay, Barbara. Hundred <laughs> percent yes, um, but not in the sense of let's all learn about autism and pity the autistic child and that sort of thing i'm going to bang back to my diversity curriculum i think it's about um double empathy let's get everybody understanding everybody and let's really accept people for who they are mm -hmm. not what we what the norm mm -hmm. let's get rid of that word and let's really explore that every single person is different and that is yeah. good and that is positive and that's what makes the world go round. Yeah, great. Would anyone else like to come up, Shardia, please? There we go. Um, and I'm, I'm back in Barbara's diversity curriculum um, because we, we do it already, but only for some isms. So, for example, we've just, you know, November's not November, October's just gone. We've just had Black History Month and that just thread through everybody's curriculum for the one month. Disability yeah. History Month doesn't have the same um, awareness. And when you look at your kind of your, your news channels and, and kind of your TV programmes, how for certain months of the year for certain focuses, I, I'm not seeing, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm not seeing that the same media retention or kind of like, you know, um, awareness going around as the other months have been given. But in regards to kind of diversity curriculum, I agree that we should be teaching, especially within the, you know, the school setting, all of our children about all of our children. And you don't need to necessarily home in only on disability. And we should be learning about just differences in general. And then, you know, when somebody is different, they're not different because everyone's different but when you just home in on, oh, why does that child, you know, have a fidget toy in school or sit on a certain cushion? It, it just, it makes them stand out. But, you know, we, we're we all different. You know, we can look on a screen and see that we're all different. And I think schools are missing, missing out on that bit of education. Um, to think that the children would be 
really you know receptive and welcoming of just talking about what's what's different or what's unique maybe use the word unique about them mm. um yeah so i'm right behind your diversity curriculum mm. well that's a, a great point on which to draw this to a close both your point shadia and barbara's and this has been a quite wonderful discussion and a fabulous set of presentations. There was a question that just came in at the last moment there. Are these references going to be, um, or will references be shared? And yes, 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 we will record, well, we have recorded this um, session tonight and we will be storing that on our own website. And we would love to share our own work and work of um, our doctoral students, which is, as you can hear, cutting edge this evening. And um, from this evening, you can hear it's, it's cutting edge. So we will share that with you. But I do want to draw this to a close. And I want to thank Barbara, Sarah, Sharon, Shardia, Simon and Clara for really inspiring us tonight with some, some new thoughts and challenges arising from your experiences. It's been simply wonderful. We have more events and the next event is on Monday, Monday the 30th from 12.30 until 2 where we celebrate autistic talent. Um, you can sign up for that and many others through our web page but it just remains for me to draw this to a close and to thank all of the presenters, all of the people behind the scenes, and all of you who came to listen this evening. So thank you very much and enjoy the rest of your evening.